Hello, everyone, and welcome to Writers Drinking Coffee. This is a podcast based on writers sitting around drinking coffee or tea and talking about writing, publishing, interesting processes, the whole creative process. We do not censor ourselves, but we don't swear a lot, so please consider us PG-13. Your hosts today are myself, John Schmidt, and David Welsh. We're talking with Samuel Coniglio, also known as Spaceman Sam and an expert on a subject I know nothing about. Hello, Sam. Hello, how's it going? I have to ask you, you're writing about space tourism. What is space tourism? Ah, well, space tourism has been happening for quite a long time now, just most people have not noticed it yet. But it's basically private individuals paying for their own way to travel into space. Um, And there's different types of space tourism are out there. And everyone knows about what happened last year in 2021 when suddenly a dozen or more people flew to space through Blue Origin, through SpaceX, through Virgin Galactic. And of course, the media made it sound like, oh, these evil billionaires spent all their money on on silly joy rides. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. What has been happening the last 20 plus years is that businesses have popped up that have been trying to find an alternative way other than NASA to get to space. And that means you're just flying to the outer edges of the atmosphere or to orbit around the moon or around the earth or to build facilities in space to have a hotel or to have uh, uh, private businesses there. Basically trying to go to the next level beyond just simply being another government laboratory in space, but to have adventures and private individuals doing things. So you you said it started earlier than this recent spate of spaciness. When did it really get started? Who were the first space tourists? Well, uh, depends on your definition. So <clears throat> back in the 1980s, there was this thing called the space shuttle program, and you know, it, space shuttle was going on for like almost oh, until about 2011, actually, and it was a very powerful tool. It was the next stage beyond the Apollo missions to the moon. It was the, a very reliable rocket ship that can get, go around the Earth and do all sorts of scientific experiments. Well, sometimes uh, they would bring guests or visitors with them on the rocket ships, and those visitors tend to be politically connected or usually just politically connected, and they were able up there because they were able to finagle their way up there. Two examples I would like to mention is Senator Jake Garn and, oh, what's his name? The guy who is the current Ministry of NASA. My brain just melted. Uh, Bill Nelson. Yes, Congressman Bill Nelson, both of whom were involved in key government committees that fund NASA back in the 1980s. And through a few comments and some committee meetings, Senator Jake Garn was able to convince NASA to give him a free flight as a quote unquote observer of what's going on up on the, on the uh, space shuttle and in space. And so he, I think he was a Republican and, and Bill Nelson was a Democrat. So they had to play fair, give each one of them a chance, each party a chance. And so they got to have their own free flights back in 1984 and 85. And just as a side note, we found there's a new term that NASA astronauts use for uh, when people get sick up in space. Mm-hmm. And they now classify it as one GARN, G-A-R-N, named after Senator Jake Garn, who vomited so much that he basically set a new new record for being sick in space. So yeah, I could go on with the details. So basically, you, that is those two guys are one of the earliest examples. Uh, some other examples was uh, Tohiro Akiyama back in 1991 and Helen Sharman from the UK in 1992, I believe. They flew up uh, uh, respectively with their government support to fly up with this, the Russians to the Soviet space station, uh, mm-hmm. Mir, the Russian space station, Mir. And it was just part of like a contest. Actually, the reporter went up there as a, a, an actual reporter being flown up by, by the government and the report, the new the NKA, NKA uh, uh, Japanese uh, news agency. And then uh, Helen Sharman won a contest. And there was this contest that was sponsored by this organization. 
and they got extra funding from the British government to help fly her uh, to the Russian space station. So those are some really, really early examples. Those are all supported in some way or another by you know, government agencies. The first true privately paid flight to space was done in 2001 by a gentleman by the name of Dennis Tito. Dennis Tito is a Los Angeles-based businessman. Uh, he did work for NASA briefly in the 1970s as a young man. Did he make, does he make vodka? No, no relation. That's a that's okay. a guy, that's, that's a good old boy from Texas. That's a whole nother whole nother story. I, I've had encounters with him as well. But anyways, Dennis Tito, businessman in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, I actually met him uh, before flight. In fact, our organization, the Space Tourism Society, helped him in, get introduced to a company called Mir Corp. M I R. Mir is the name of the old uh, Russian space station. And there was a company trying to buy or rent the Russian space station because in the early 1990s, or actually late 1990s, the Russian space station Mir was getting kind of old. And they were trying to figure out what to do with it. And the United States was working on the International Space Station. And that was going to be a joint effort between the U.S. and Russia. And NASA was trying to convince Russia. It was like, hey, you don't need that old space station. Get rid of it. And some private Wait a business. Second. Was, Let, let's go back a second. What, what society are you part of? I'm part of several groups, but this is called the Space Tourism Society. Space Tourism Society. And let me ask, and it's a slightly rude question, how much of an expert are you in this field? I've been working on this since 1996, been doing presentations and going to conferences and doing public speaking on this topic for a long time and uh, trying to educate the public about the idea of private space travel and the idea that you and I, you and I, not just billionaires, but regular folks could eventually go into space. And the key to that is to reduce the cost to access and improve the safety value. Right. And also so, remind people, go ahead, please. Oh me. yeah, so um, I mean, I think that's that's key. It's like the key word there that you said is eventually. What What is, what does eventually mean? What's the timeline look at? When, when, when are we going to see, um, you know, Walt Disney in space, whatever? Well, a couple of things here. First of all, when you think of, of tourism, you're thinking of Disney World. You're thinking of people with funny hats and cameras and they're walking around Disneyland Park taking pictures. Sure. Space tourism is an adventure you must prepare for. There are training programs and you spend months preparing yourself mentally and physically to be physically fit, to learn Russian, to understand the controls and engineering. This is not something you just simply you know, buy a ticket and go to. The, so the word tourism gives you kind of a, uh, is, is a little bit misleading. Yes, and I want to take it next further. Do you know about adventure tourism? Yeah, basically there's, I mean, I guess several different kinds of there. There's a, there's a whole um, there are a whole slew of industries: adventure tourism, ecotourism, medical tourism. Basically, you're going somewhere else to to do something that isn't necessarily just look around and take pictures, right? So, exactly, exactly. There's there's passive tourism things like going to a science center, going to Disney World, where you simply buy a ticket and go. Right. And then there's things that are a little bit more advanced, where you have to pay real money and do some planning to go to another country. Mm -hmm. Or in some of the more extreme cases, like if you want to climb Mount Everest, you have to do a lot of physical fitness training and a lot of mountain preparation beforehand. And then you have to you know, hire the Sherpas, you have to hire a team of coordinators to work with to get, get a base camp set up. You have, to, you have right. to learn how to climb a mountain because this is not something you just simply you know, hop off a plane and do. Right. This is like a lot of preparation. Right. Well, yeah, odds are you're a pretty serious mountaineer to begin with. Correct. So space tourism is in that realm of adventure travel, adventure tourism. Yes, it is very costly right now, but one day it will change. Key to bringing the cost of this adventure down is efficient space travel, efficient and safe rocket ships, habitats that are designed for regular people, not engineer super scientists like the astronauts are. Uh, in uh, systems that would make it easy for people who are, you know, like regular folks like us to take the next step, say, okay, I got to take these, this basic training and then I can fly. You know, when you fly in an airplane right now, 
at the very beginning of the flight, the attendants will, uh, will have like the, the, the safety mask, and then they'll tell you to read the manual about what to do in emergencies. And you have the escape hatches over here in the front and the back and over here. Right. That is like the barest minimum training. And of course, most people are not even paying attention to it. But there are situations where you really should be paying attention to that a lot more detail. And that when it, comes, when it comes to space travel, everything is life or death. If you make a mistake, if you push the wrong button, you will die. Plain and simple. Everything you do right now associated with space travel, there is extremely high chance you will die or get hurt really badly. You take a training class, and you take it very seriously, and you have to do a lot of preparation. So right now, just like talking about Mount Everest, you know, people die on Mount Everest all the time. They leave the bodies there, by the way. Uh, oh, yeah. they, it's, it's hella dangerous thing to do. There are, I know I've known folks who literally will sail around the world on their own boat. It yep. took a lot of preparation. You know, that type of stuff. Actually, going up Everest isn't that dangerous. 85% of the ones who died, died coming down. Mm -hmm. So I also wanted to, to mention, um, so regarding this training thing, there was a story in the news recently of a, uh, uh, a fighter jet tourist, somebody, some, somebody uh, an engineer for an aerospace company, I think, got a, uh, a flight in a fighter jet that he had helped work on during his career. I think he was about to retire or something. And um, he got the bare minimum of training, uh, partly because it was a surprise and they didn't want to spoil the surprise by, you know, like having him train the week before or something. So he went up and managed to um, manage to eject himself from the plane. Yeah, uh, that. Due to ignorance. Yeah, so so he survived, but I can imagine, like you're saying, in, in, in space, that that's not a survivable event screwing up and hitting us hitting the wrong bar sam as a, as a question you you talk about convenience and safety and cost would the space tourism in your vision and obviously you have many visions be more like riding the vomit comet where you could even do a music video if you were okay go or more like true adventure adventure training you're they're not going to hand you an astronaut or a mission specialist job but you will be near the controls what do you envision well, uh, it's funny you mentioned that. Uh, at the Space Tourism Society, we've broken down the concept of the space experience into different levels. In fact, the whole space tourism experience comes in, in several cases of, we break it across cost of access versus number of participants. So at the most elite level, the real space level, it's a very tiny part of the pyramid at the very top. Where people have spent a large amount of money and a lot of time and training to prepare. The next level up down would be the suborbital flights, like, like what they did at Blue Origin with Virgin Galactic. They just get, they hop on a ride and they go to the very you know, outer edges of the space, like the, uh, the 60 kilometer, 50 kilometer limit, wherever it is for the technically edge of space, where they supposedly will get their astronaut wings and then come back down. And the next level down, the zero gravity flights, like you talked about with Zero G Corp. And there's several other companies like that around the world where you can actually fly on an airplane that would do what's called a parabolic ride where you get about 30 seconds of zero G. Pretty amazing, pretty fun. The next level where there's more people available to participate in immersive simulations. There are places in Hawaii, Spain, and a couple other places, even uh, uh, in Northern Canada, where you can spend a couple weeks in a remote location in a simulated Mars habitat. And you spend that time there pretending to be a scientist and you, you may actually do real science work as well. So there are simulations that you can prepare for to do this type of stuff. And then finally, at the very bottom of the pyramid, the widest part of the mass amount of participation is computer simulations, virtual worlds, the metaverse, the Sims, that type of stuff, going to the Disney worlds, going to the, the, the air and space museums, going to the science centers. That is the least expensive and safest way to experience space without having to like, you know, prepare for life or death situations. Right. But it's a gateway drug to some people. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So you, you've mentioned the society a, a couple of times. Do you guys have meetings or anything? Yeah, so the Space Tourism Society is a nonprofit organization and we've had chapters around the world. And, and really it's it, an informal group of activists uh, primarily based in Los Angeles, because that's where the founder is based at. John Spencer is the founder of the organization. 
and we would have conferences and gatherings uh, in different parts of the world. Sometimes we would synchronize with another event called the Yuri's Night World Space Party that happens every uh, April 12th to celebrate, you know, Yuri Gagarin's first flight in space. First man in space and used to be a yeah. big party in the Bay Area. But anyway. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and so we are a bunch of futurists and visionaries that think about, well, what would it be like to live off world? and How can we make that more comfortable and make it easier? Uh, John Spencer, the founder of the organization, is a space architect. He has designed habitats for off-world living. And at the same time, he has designed theme parks. Hmm. And uh -huh. so he has, yeah, so there's a relationship there. So I wasn't, I wasn't that far off. No, you weren't. You were not. We, when I was working really close with John back in the early 2000s, I was actually going to the, a step further saying, okay, if you're going to design a theme park or design a space hotel, what would it look like? What would the accommodations look like? What would the seating look like? What would the drinking look like? How would you get served uh, food and drinks? How would you sleep? What would it be like? And so I started diving deeper and I started making prototypes and mock-ups of these concepts. And that's where the, the cocktail glass concept came from. This is where the service robots came into play. This is where I invented a thing called the snuggle tunnel, which was kind of like this little intimacy okay. place okay i need to to know about all three of these things you got to slow down and, and parse them out for me a little bit a, okay. a snuggle tunnel makes sense you're, you're going to have a constrained space that is softly bounded so you can sleep easily and not run into corners robots drink things what are the what, what do you robots Ooh. the challenge with maintaining a spacecraft and to make it as co as comfortable as possible is that there's lots of little things that need to be done. There's lots of cleanup that needs to be done. There's lots of uh, maintenance work that needs to be done. Uh, things float, okay? Mm -hmm. Things float all the time. Notoriously so, if, so yes. if you eat a cookie in space, guess what? The cookies don't fall to the ground. They just sit there, right there, floating in front of your face. That's why you need a, va a va portable vacuum cleaner with you. Roomba 3D. Things, bingo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So back in 2005, I invented this like service robot that had these ducted fan jet blades built into it, almost like an RC control vehicle that will have an interchangeable part in the middle that could be used for things like a vacuum cleaner. Or maybe it's a butler that has a place to hold your drinks or it is a maintenance vehicle with arms that can pick things up and move it around. Uh, built in this robot also are sensors for both radiation and chemicals. You have to worry about CO2 levels. You have to worry about radiation levels. You have to worry about other things that may be, you know, you have other types of poisons that could be an issue. And so you would have these robots constantly patrolling the entire space station, the entire space hotel to, you know, not only, you know, do services to help the people working there, but or, or living there, but also to just keep an eye on things. And what I didn't realize is that about five, 10 years later, this thing called drones became a thing. So I invented the drone about like 10 years before it became a popular thing. Go figure. That's, that's one object. The cocktail glass. Uh, one of the challenges of drinking in space is that without gravity, surface tension becomes a big issue. Water and other liquids like to stick to things. And there's some great videos up on YouTube that show astronaut Chris Hadfield trying to like get a washcloth wet mm -hmm. and he squeezes the washcloth out and the mm -hmm. water doesn't go away. The water simply starts glomming all over his hand like a big blob. So I tell people that in space, we have to worry about blob management. How do you manage the liquids? And so the containers that NASA uses right now for asking us to drink liquids is basically a squeeze tube, a squeeze bag with a straw at the end, and you have to have a cap on it because without the cap, there's this thing called capillary action, and the liquid loves to ooze out by itself. So there's all sorts of issues with making messes. Uh, another topic I talk about is taking showers, and, and this is also related to drinking in space because it's all about blob management. What do you do with the liquids when they start spilling out? How do you control it? With the zero gravity cocktail glass that I invented, I thought, wouldn't it be fun to drink a cocktail in space but have an open container? How do you do that? Well, there's this way that you can cut grooves into a glass so that they will 
keep the liquids in place, but all you have to do is suck on it and the liquids will be forced into one direction. And so that, that was the idea of a cocktail glass, or it could be a drinking vessel of any kind that you could use a groove system, grooves that are channeled usually about 30 degrees angle, like a V shape uh, inside the glass that you can control the flow of the liquid. So you're essentially, uh -huh. you're essentially um, using capillary reaction to um, control the liquid, right? Exactly, exactly. The challenge is trying to figure out how to manage the fluid flow, but yet allow the user to smell and to enjoy the essence of the drink. And this includes coffee as well, by the way, and tea. Right, well, um, liquids. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about making things for space. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your process because you're on, you are a writer and you're writing a book about all of this because, wow, you have a huge amount of knowledge on it. When did you start to write a book and where are you in the writing of it? Uh, let's see. I, this might be the 10th attempt at writing this book. I, like I said, I've been writing, working on this on and off God, since the early 2000s. Um, you, you told me you were being really successful. What's the difference? The difference now is that I have outside validation. I hired a career, a, a book coach who is helping me with the outline. And here's a challenge with this. I may have a lot of knowledge. The problem is I think I have too much knowledge and I got to filter it down. And so the challenge was, how do you write a book about designing for space travel when you can run off into a million different tangents? And so the challenge I was running into was like, well, do I talk about radiation and the asteroids hitting the space station? How do you protect against that? How do I talk about these other aspects? And I realized, no, step back further, get to the basics, get to the fundamentals. I'm not an engineer, I'm not a scientist, but I've done enough research to be dangerous. So let's step back and focus on a topic that not enough people are talking about. And the things they're not talking about are creature comforts. What is a creature comfort? And the idea of a creature comfort is simply, you know, how to have a cup of coffee. How do you have a shower? How do you have, you know, heating and air conditioning, hot food, skin lotion, plants, gardening, bacon, all these little things that help you define what a creature comfort is. Something that makes you relax and feel like a human being, despite whatever the heck else is happening in the outside world, these little tiny things help you feel good, help oh. you enjoy life. Your, your outside world in this case is um, very uh, alien to human existence, right? Space is yeah, kind so, of, so, so you've got the most difficult job to make someone feel at home, but, but also seems pretty important if you're going to be comfortable in space, which is to some extent what tourism has to be about. Yeah, it, this is once again, getting out of your comfort zone and then building a new comfort zone in this environment. Have any of you guys gone camping? Yep. Yeah, of course. Okay. Have you ever done extreme camping, like in a desert environment? Like Burning Man? I was about to lead up to that, yes. <laughs> yes. So in a extreme environment, such as a desert, such as Burning Man, where you have a place that has fine dust that's trying to get into all of your skin, get into your lungs, get into your eyes. You have dust storms flowing. You have extreme temperatures of over 100 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and maybe in the 40s at night, happening every single day, day in, day out. There's no support system out there. You know, there's, you know, you have to bring your own water, bring your own food, bring your own supplies, sometimes bring your own toilets. You have to prepare for every contingency emergencies, bring your, bring your first aid kit, all that stuff. And yet thousands of people go to this hellacious place that's trying to kill you. Why? I don't know. Because somehow they made a party out of it. Somehow they made it fun. And so the adventure of going to Burning Man or places or an extreme environment like that or going camping is that, okay, what can I live without? And then, okay, how can I improvise the things I really can't live without? And that brings up creativity. That brings up imagination. What can I do to reinvent a comfortable thing in this weird place that's trying to kill me? And that's where, you know, my wife and I invented things like uh, 
a portable tea service. We have a picnic basket with a camping stove built in and a, uh, a fine china cups and, and, and a serviceable tea set. And so we go out into the middle of the desert, pick a spot, and then we start serving tea. We, we boil the water right there. We put the uh, tea bags into the teapot and we are making and pouring tea in fine china cups with saucers and serving cream and sugar to whoever wants it. Meanwhile, there's a dust, dust storm going on. So that's are a, we crazy? Yes. Of, of course you are, but you're providing a creature comfort in a alkaline dust environment and it's adventure camping, certainly. So I, I can see the uh, relevance to this. I do wanna go slightly back. You got a book coach and that's kicked you into motion. When do you expect to have a book roughly? Well, like I said, my goal is to have a full solid draft by the end of the end of April. That's 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 the goal. Um, we'll see. Uh, I'm now by the end of April. In, well, primarily because I have that conference. Uh, the neat thing about this book writing thing is deadlines, it's deadlines, deadlines, deadlines. When you have an external deadline, when you got other people expecting to get something done, it motivates you. It really motivates you. It forces you to realize, oh, crap, I better talk about my thing. So I have to have something to talk about. I better put those words down ASAP. So having a deadline is huge. Having external validation is huge. Having a coach is very useful. If there's a writer's group you can get involved in, that's great. But you just need some type of external validation, some type of external deadline to force you to get out of your comfort zone and just do it. Just right. Another thing, speaking of comfort zone, and everything's about comfort here, it seems, get out of your house and go someplace else or a, a whatever coffee shop du jour you got, wherever you're at. And we, we prefer just, the bean scene and Oxford Street, but yeah, your local coffee yeah, shop. Yeah, exactly. Someplace that's not your house, someplace that's away from like, oh, there's a cute kitty. Oh, there's social media. Oh, there's this. Oh, there's that. And suddenly he's like, oh, I'm doing all the dishes and I got the garbage out and I'm doing all, I just organized my spice rack for the 20th time. You know, the thing, everything but the actual sitting down your butt and writing. One quick final question. You have a lot of passions. Is there anything we've missed that you want to cover? I've got a lot of other hobbies besides space, although space is my, one of my biggest passions. But, but if I have the time after I get this one book published, I, was, I want to talk about things such as Burning Man and the Cacophony Society and uh, the little group I'm involved in called Obtainium Works. I've been a burner for 15 years, have been participating in all sorts of wild and wacky events, but also started in San Francisco with a thing called the Cacophony Society with a merry band of pranksters who did silly things like dressing up as salmon, running down the streets or playing well, golf a, in the middle of the city. Running you know. against the beta breakers was the salmon thing. And of course we met waltz bombing, which I had done with the original Cacophony yeah. Society. Oh yes, yes, yes. Uh, in 2003, my second burn, I said, hey, let's do random acts of ballroom dancing and let's go hit random camps and teach them how to do waltzes and polkas and shadishes. That's right, thank you for reminding me. And that was around the time I met my wife-to-be, actually, right around that mm -hmm. time, so small world so yeah so all sorts of wonderful underground arts and prankster type of situations then of course the group i'm now involved with the obtainium works crew obtainium fancy word for objects that are found or collected by various means usually legally and we build art cars we build all sorts of art vehicles and our most famous one is the never was hall the Never Was Hall is a three-story Victorian house on wheels designed to travel through the desert at Burning Man. And yes, it is 24 feet tall and it does move when it wants to. The crew of the Never Was Hall also build other art vehicles such as pirate ships, such as submarines, such as whimsical Alice in Wonderland vehicles, such as uh, drivable skirts and other creatures. And uh, we have an art car factory in Vallejo, California. And we just take golf carts, we take handicap scooters, we take bicycles, tear them apart, reconfigure them, and turn them into these whimsical vehicles. What else? Golly. I think that's, no. oh, and of course, my cocktail making robots. How can I forget that? Oh my goodness. 
Somewhere along I, the way, I got involved with cocktail robotics. We're going to we're going to talk about that in a separate episode. Oh, OK. Yes. Yes. So, so we're going to I'll put links to all the stories and all these things you've mentioned on the website, which is, of course, www.writersdrinkingcoffee.com. You can find us on Facebook or Twitter. We answer email. We do respond to tweets. Sam, can we put your contact info in so people can email you and tweet at you? Sure, certainly. We'll have it in our notes then. You have been listening to Writers Drinking Coffee, a labor of love and enthusiasm put together by the hosts. We're thankful that Sam has brought so much enthusiasm here and we'll be certain to have him back. Our main web support magic is brought to you by Deirdre Schween and our sound engineer and backup web spider and host today is David Welsh. Our intro music is Pretty Made Milking a Cow and our exit music is Breakfast with a Morning Person, both by Michael Engberg. You can hear more from Michael Engberg on manyhatsmusic.com. Our podcast sponsors today are the Obtanium Works in Vallejo and Arm Street, purveyors of fine medieval wares and blankets. Please keep writing. And hey, thanks for listening. <laughs>